Hello, everybody. Mike here. Before we get started with this episode, we have a little bit of an update. update. If you remember last week, episode 470, we covered the virtual Ed Sullivan show. Well, you probably didn't have much of a chance to see it because literally that day it got yanked from YouTube. It got yanked on the 9th of May. We're doing so good. And oh, by the way, we're going to revisit this topic in our next episode, in episode 472. Because, funny story, something similar happened. Similar, but different. But we'll get to that on Thursday. But for now, let's get personal. Theme music. Let's get personal? No, yeah, it's not. Let's get physical. It, it, oh, it, sorry, oh my sorry, gosh. sorry. You know how much I love Dua Lipa. I thought you were doing Olivia Newton-John there, not Dua Lipa. No. no. Let's no, get hip- personal. Personal. Okay. Greg is hip to what the kids are up to. Me, not so much. Here's the theme music. No, hold on. No, no, we're not putting theme music in there. And Mike, he is totally off the charts in terms of knowledge of pop culture. Theme music. Now let's get personal. I got a joke here. This episode, catch me or I'll go Houdini. Right over my head. Ow. <laughs> shit, I hit my head there. I really did hit my head there. Are we finally playing the damn theme music? Yes. An anthology about the bad, the short-lived, and the forgotten shows and events in television history. This is It Was a Thing on TV. Before I change my mind, I give you Super Train. Oh, episode 471, episode 2540. Let's get personal. Let's get personal was a pilot in 1982. I want to say it was for NBC, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Would you like to be an undercover agent for the CIA? Well, this lawyer says he would. He also says he's traditional, optimistic, and lovable. He's Jack Champion. Here's an honest-to-goodness former Mouseketeer who hung up her ears long ago. She still pulls some pretty entertaining stunts, like the time she surprised her husband with a ride in an old-fashioned hot air balloon. She says she's impulsive, erotic, and family-oriented. This is Judy Reichman. Good morning, everybody. I'm Chuck Woolery. Let's get first. Now let's get personal. Boy, how many times am I going to say that throughout the show? Let's get personal. That's my new catchphrase this week. You heard the open there, and I bet you that sounds familiar to people. The theme there was one of the themes to Dreamhouse, which premiered on NBC a year later, 1983. Not a full 12 months later, probably, but in the calendar year 1983. And may I just say, I love that theme to Dreamhouse. Not that the other one was bad, but that's the one that just like resonates with me. It hits, as the kids would say. And the thing is, I thought that was unique to Dreamhouse. Apparently, that's stock music. Or if it's not necessarily stock music, obviously it got repeated in this capacity for this pilot. So let's get personal. It's a psychology game. No, really it is. And if you look at television history, how many games have there been where it's psychology-based? I think the game game was a sort of psychological game. The entry with Jim McCrell back in the late 60s and early 70s, like 69, 70. Wait till you have kids. If you remember that, which was on... Family Channel in 1996. It was basically, here's a hypothetical situation involving a child. Does your answer match up with what the expert says? You know, I'm sure there's others. And really, I think, and this isn't necessarily psychological, but maybe you could even say mind readers a little bit. Yes, it's like ESP, but... Somebody's rationale involves psychology, and you want to try and match that rationale. 
But needless to say, the number of shows that involve psychology as like the basis of a game, very few, probably less than, I'd say 10, probably even less than five. Maybe the names I mentioned are all the shows that would qualify for that. So this show, you have two contestants, and they fill out a questionnaire, and it sounds like it's computerized, but also there's a little bit of assistance from psychologists. And I say psychologists because actually there is one psychologist who is in the studio, not necessarily a co-host per se, but gives the answers or the rationale to the answers that are given. And then looking at the credits, there are two additional psychology experts who are sort of like advisors. So you had three psychologists, three people in the psychology field working on this show, one in front of the camera, two behind the scenes. So this test was given, partially computerized, partially administered by a professional, and different character traits were discovered of the two contestants on the show that day. And the idea was that for each of the three rounds of the main game, the trait that would be covered would be a common trait shared between the two contestants. The contestants would be given five statements in round one, and they would have to give an answer, one of two answers. So it's an either-or situation. Given a situation, would you do A or would you do B? For example, one of the situations was about moving, and they said, would you rather handle your relative's items like china or antiques? Would you rather handle them with care and take care of them or just leave them behind? And that had to deal with like empathy or sympathy or something like that. So there are right answers based on the personality trait that those questions are based on. Or maybe not a right answer, but a best answer. Because again, this is very subjective. These are professionals who are giving their opinions. So, you know, there's nothing that is set in stone as to how somebody would act. But again, expert opinion. They're the ones who went to college, got the expensive degrees, maybe even the doctorate. So we got to take them for their word. There were five questions in round one, and each question was worth $25. Big 25 bucks. That was like the equivalent of a million bucks back in 1982. Given inflation nowadays, it's like a million dollars back in 1982. And then it repeats in the second and third rounds, but there's a little twist with the second round. So the third round, again, statements. And another personality trait that is shared by the two players, and the answer to the question is like previous, but at this time, it's $100 a question. That's for round three. But if we go back to round two, this, I think, is the reason why we put this on the schedule for this year. So you had five statements again, but it was delivered by a troupe of actors, specifically three actors. I should also add specifically three actors, two of whom are in the It Was a Thing on TV Hall of Fame. The third very well may be in the Hall of Fame next year. So the name of the troupe is called the Alter Ego Players. But again, three, I'm not going to say huge names, but for our intents and purposes, huge names. Sally Julian, who we talked about on Sale of the Century back in 1983, and she was also on A Week of Match Game Hollywood Squares, and she's done a number of voices in the past on cartoons. Again, it was a thing on TV Hall of Famer, Sally Julian. And not then... Officially. I thought she's in the Hall of Fame. No, she's not. Okay, then you know what? We have one Hall of Famer and two hopefully eventually going to be Hall of Famers. So she's not in, but you know what? That case, I don't want to say it's solidified, but I think there's a good chance she may be going in in 2025. The second name. This is the for sure not a Hall of Famer yet, but again, building a resume. 
making a case. Larry Anderson, we talked about him. Oh, my gosh, where haven't we talked about him? We've mentioned he was the host of Truth or Consequences back in 1987. He was a host of The Big Spin for a while. But also, he was on Life with Lucy. And he was on one of the college shows, because I remember his name came up on the college shows in 1979. I want to say Brothers and Sisters. And again, I want to point out, not the baseball player, Larry. Not the person who was traded for Jeff Bagwell back in 1990. No. So the 1979 college show that we talked about that he was on was Brothers and Sisters. He was Harlan Ramsey. So you know what this means? What? On that episode, uh, on the Brothers and Sisters segment of that episode, he didn't play Zipper! 470 episodes later almost, and it doesn't get old. But yeah, you know Larry Anderson. He's a very well-known actor, magician, host, funny guy. And fingers crossed, he was the thing on TV, Hall of Famer, in 2025. But now we get to the legit Hall of Famer. I think this is the first person we actually declared as a friend of the podcast. We've talked about him. Oh, gosh, where haven't we talked about him? He was the host on Dick Dietrich's Nightstand. And we've seen him all over the place as a character actor. I would say that in the last 20, 25 years, we would probably best know him from Son of the Beach. One of those really underrated TV shows. I think that is hilarious. And I think that came from uh, Howard Stern, if I remember correctly. I think that was yes, his company, or he wrote it. Yeah. And let's not forget Parker Lewis's daddy. Parker Lewis's daddy. I forgot about that. So now you know why this person is in the Hall of Fame. We're talking about the one and only Timothy Stack, or Tim Stack. Or television's Tim Sack, as he sometimes goes by. But if you go back, oh gosh, this must have been episode 30, episode 40. Sometime in the early double digits, we did Nightstand. And no joke, Tim Stack got an alert, because apparently his devices have an alert to let him know if Nightstand pops up on the internet, Lo and behold, we do this episode, and Tim Stack like messages us saying, "Oh, thank you for covering the show, and, and I didn't expect this. I mean, he reached out to us. It, it was shocking to us, but also, I'm sure at the same time, Timothy Stack's like, who's talking about Nightstand 25 years after it went off the air? We. Well, we did, but, but also, again, I just find it hilarious that Timothy Stack, whether it's an ego thing or just a curiosity thing, has some sort of alert on his device, if it's an Alexa or what have you, to like let him know whenever something nightstand pops up on the internet. So yay us, I think. But yeah, Tim Stack, I mean, beyond that, he's been on so many things. And he's probably going to show up on so many things coming up in the future. So those are our alter ego players. A Hall of Famer and two potentially very soon to be Hall of Famer. And they act out a scene in this round two. And the scene in this case is at a movie theater. And it's Sally Julian with Larry Anderson. And I know Chico has stuff to say about this especially when Tim Stack appears on screen, specifically one item that Tim Stack is donning. Chico, I'm not even going to wait. Tell us what just, like, absolutely blew your mind. Okay, so this pilot has been on YouTube for a while now. I watched it on the morning before we recorded this. I didn't notice it at first. Tim Stack was playing an usher of a movie theater where Larry Anderson and Sally Julian were seeing whatever the feel-good film of 1982 was, 
E.T. Come on, E.T. I'm not joking. And, that, that was the movie of 1982. Okay, so his Usher jacket, I took a very close look. That is one of the jackets from Super Train. That is a staff jacket from Super Train. I'm like, how the hell does NBC still have this Super Train jacket? They're trying to recoup as much of their losses as possible, apparently. Three years later, they're like, no, no, we need to hold on to this. There might be a game show where we, we can put Tim Stack in this jacket so he sort of looks like a conductor or an usher. Trust me, guys, we got this. This jacket is going to be useful in 1982. Now you maybe wish Super Train had lasted like four or five seasons so Tim Stack would have been in the cast in season four. Okay, I'm looking at the pilot right now, specifically where Tim Stack's wearing that jacket. And son of a gun, I think Chico is 100% on the nose. That looks like the Super Train logo. Now, obviously, you can't really see it because it's a little you know, circle, probably about three inches in diameter. But you can see it looks like the Super Train graphic. I'm blown, Chico. This is an amazing discovery. I know I usually do the amazing discoveries when we do them like every 200 episodes. But that, my friend, is an amazing discovery. Is it worth the Amazing Discovery music? Well, I can give you the Amazing Discovery music, but also please remember, I believe we attached my name to it, so it's Amazing Discoveries with Mike Klaus. I don't feel like re-recording that this weekend with your name in place of mine. You can take credit for my Amazing Discovery. No, it's not that. I'm just a lazy ass. I just don't <laughs> want to do it. Now, now, hold on, Mike. You think the dude from Amazing Discoveries, what Mike, whatever his name, last name was, like made the discoveries himself. No, he brought people on who had the Amazing Discovery. So you're giving me credit, even though I don't deserve the credit. Correct. Take the win, Mike. God. Well, no, I feel very generous. I don't want to take credit away from you. Oh, Mike Levy, that's the guy. Mike, I'll say it's Mike Levy, yeah. So, yes, you get the Amazing Discoveries music. And if I feel like it, I'm going to edit your name in there. And if I don't feel like editing your name in there, tough crap. Hey, I wonder what we're going to do with that Amazing Discoveries music. Let's find out. Now, here's the host of Amazing Discoveries, Mike Klaus. Boy, that's so shocking what happened there. Well, you know, we got to fill this because... It's only like a 19-minute pilot, so you got to do a little bit of padding here, guys. So now the five questions in that round where you had the alter ego players doing this theater scene, they're worth $50 each. And then, as I said earlier, the third round, they pick another personality trait different from the first two rounds that is shared by both contestants, and they play for $100 a question. And that's the final round. Whoever's got the most money... They advance, but they did state on this pilot, if they're tied after three rounds, the person who won two rounds advances. In the final round, there are no more shared personality traits because it's just one player playing. But another personality trait from the winner is chosen, and hypothetical situations are given with three multiple choices. And the experts slash personality test, they have assigned an answer which matches what that personality trait would say. Now, the thing is, and I should have mentioned this earlier, the personality traits are never said to the contestants, but they're shown on screen to the at-home audience. So, for example, in this final round, the personality trait was romantic. So what had to be done was the contestant had to pick the answer that best fit the romantic personality trait. And if the contestant got seven right in 60 seconds, they won $5,000. Well, saying seven right, maybe that's just not fun. 
that's just too generic. What happened is every time you got an answer correct, you got a letter in the words, let's get. So four letters in let's, three letters in get, seven. Adorable. And I wonder if there's actually some logic behind this, because on the display on the screen, you saw let's get, and then they had this big sign that said $5,000 underneath. So I wonder if they actually wanted to say, let's get $5,000. I don't know. It's just a corny mechanism. Instead of saying seven right, spell let's get. Now, we didn't even talk about who hosted this show, and I think if you think about it, this is a good match given what this person would start hosting a year later. Chuck Woolery. That's also another reason why I believe this is NBC because obviously Chuck Woolery within the last year was at Wheel of Fortune. I don't think he harbored any sort of grudge against NBC over that. It was against Merv Griffin. So maybe NBC wanted to try and bring him back because he's a big name, big personality, still on good terms with the network, even if he's not on good terms with Merv Griffin personal. But also, again, remember, in 1983, early 1983, he started hosting a little show he's probably best known for, not that almost seven years of Wheel of Fortune was for naught, but he hosted Love Connection. And I think you can see sort of ties to Love Connection with this show. But also, again, let's remember about a year and a half after this, he hosted a little show on NBC called Scrabble, and that ran for six years. So like I said, he did good things for NBC. I don't think they uh, necessarily want to get rid of him. But also, why I think this is NBC, beyond the Chuck Woolery factor, again, the music that you heard at the open was the Dreamhouse music. One of the Dreamhouse themes, I should say. And what network was Dreamhouse on? That's right, CBS. No, <laughs> NBC. Well, I, there was no answer from you guys, so I want to see if you're paying attention. It was NBC. So I think there might be some logical, natural ties there. Also, the super train jacket. Are we just going to ignore the super train jacket? Yes, because that was my amazing discovery, not yours. <laughs> hey, look, I, I'm doing my impersonation of Thomas Edison. <laughs> Too soon? 150 years later? Whatever. A little bit. But actually, you know what? That is a very great point. The Super Train Jacket, for all you know, whatever studio this is recorded in, if it was done at Burbank, oh, look, our prop department has these jackets that have this insignia, this emblem on them that, you know what? On the 1982 TV, it's going to look normal nobody's gonna see what it is in 2024 though we have a lot better resolution than 1982 tvs and monitors had so we can actually see these things so yeah i think tying in all of those factors i think we've got to say this is an nbc pilot between chuck woolery possibly the Dreamhouse theme but definitely for the super train jack but there's another name, and maybe one day this guy is going to get in the Hall of Fame. I'm talking about one of the contestants, and if you know anything about game shows, you likely have heard the name Jack Campion. He is like the king of game show pilots. I don't think he had ever been on a game show proper, but good heavens, the number of pilots he did I mean, of all the pilots out there, I'm sure the number is somewhere in the double digits. I know he was on the blank check pilot. I think he was on a card sharks pilot. This pilot, he was on one of the Jeopardy pilots. I'm not going to go through all of them, but like I said, I would not be surprised if that number was double digits, and if not double digits, at least eight or nine that we know of. Now, hold on, Mike. He was on the pilot's second chance, 1977, and the pilot's pressure lock. 
Okay, so that's six right there, and I'm sure he's been on other ones. But again, I don't think he ever was on a game show proper just because you know they use him so much in pilots, possibly. I don't know. And I did phrase that uh, as if he were deceased because not me, but uh, some friends in the last year or two did some research and uh, found out that he passed away sometime around 2015 or 2016. November 11th, 2016. And another person I want to add, and I know we don't talk about this guy, but this guy, I want to put him in the Hall of Fame just because he is an amazing personality. Not just an amazing personality necessarily on camera, but specifically for his writing. In this episode, he was a producer, a gentleman by the name of Mark Maxwell Smith. You've surely heard of him. He has created games, produced games. One of his first jobs was actually on Truth or Consequences in the early 70s with Bob Barker. But the place that I know him from, and I'm sure many of you know him from, he was the creator of Talk About, or if you're in Canada, Talk About. But he has done so many shows. Oh, Crosswits, the original Crosswits. He was one of the crew writers for that, and just like I said, an underrated genius. I know we don't talk about him much, but seriously, if I could put him in the Hall of Fame, I would actually consider it because he just has left that much of a mark on game shows. He was also a producer on the PAX episodes of Supermarket Sweep. Well, again, his career now has probably spanned close to 50 years, if not more than that. So, yeah, he'll get around, and he's a known name, very well known in the business. I just think, for lack of a better word, us normies don't give him the credit that he deserves. And I did want to add... The production company behind this was Theremka Productions, T-H-O-R-E-M-C-A. And doing a little bit of searching, they have one other credit to their name, at least it's on IMDb. A documentary from 1985 called The Look about models, including Carol Alt. But that's it. They did The Look. They did Let's Get Personal. And that's the list. Chico just reminded me of another amazing discovery. He's on a roll this week. Man, I might actually have to do that edit that I might have done earlier in this episode. Tee hee hee. The onset psychologist who gave the rationale to the answers was named Dr. Karen Shaner. Chico, do you have any information about Dr. Karen Shaner? Oh, boy, howdy, do I. She is not just a clinical psychologist. She's an author and one of the leading voices of talk radio in the Washington, D.C. area from 1979 to 1984, where she was a host of a show on WRC Radio. Also a uh, contributor to Larry King Live, CBS Nightly News, Dateline, Today, and Oprah. Also a regular contributor on CNN, as well as a resident psychologist on Good Morning Washington. Sadly, no longer with us. She died in 2018 at the age of 75. So that time frame she worked on Washington, D.C. radio lines up perfectly with this. Since you guys have seen the pilot, do you guys have any thoughts or last comments about whether this should have made it to air? What could have been better? What could have been worse? I watched the pilot and I'm thinking to myself, this looks like a remnant of something that would only come out of the me decade, which if you know, was the 1970s. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the sort of show that would have worked on a cable outlet like Lifetime or something, but not necessarily in broadcast television in the morning time. You look at the set alone. It was just... This whole laid-back morning talk show, game show, psych show, whatever it is the alter ego players were doing, hybrid. 
And what does one person say? It's like, if you cannot explain the premise in one line, it's too complex. It was a bit complex for our morning show. And also, I'm looking at this from a game standpoint, and Chuck Woolery was absolutely right. This is one game that if you told the truth from beginning to end, you will have absolutely no problem winning. And even if you don't win, hey, at least you'll learn something about yourself, right? That does remind me, they actually touted at the show's open, anybody who got every question right would win a VCR and a 21-inch TV. But now that I'm looking at this, I definitely get your vibe of early 80s talk show. I don't want to say a specific name, but it sort of reminds me of the John Davidson show. I thought the John Davidson show looked a little like this. And the John Davidson show would definitely line up in the early 80s, 81, 82, 83-ish. Really? We're not going to pull out the chestnut of Shadow Stevens? Well, I guess I need to go pull it out unless somebody wants to chime in. Joe Davidson! Greg, I appreciate your effort, but I think I'm going to let a pro handle it. That set, it really speaks like early 80s talk show or even like a local talk show. That might be where I am uh, seeing this. Like uh, one show that we've talked about in the past, a Cleveland show of all things, I believe it had plants on the set like this does. Ficuses and stuff like that. But also, it sort of reminds me, again, with the plants, of It's Anybody's Guess. They had plants on the set and had very similar sort of colors you know, with the wood and stuff like that. That would have been 77, so that would have been about five years earlier. But again, it very much invokes a daytime talk show circa 1981, 1982. And actually, you mentioned Lifetime. Really, I think that's like a perfect answer because I could definitely see like, oh gosh, I hate invoking this name because I'm afraid of what's going to happen. Maybe some British guy will come out and try to you know, propose to her. But Linda Dano, I think, you know, had uh, a talk show on Lifetime that looked very much like this. You really didn't see me invoking that British guy who likes Linda Dano while talking about something totally unrelated, did you? We're sneaky like that. <laughs> no. In the end, I think we can say that let's get personal. Maybe they're getting a little too personal. Maybe TV viewers don't want to see psychologically based game shows. And for those reasons, let's get personal. Even though it didn't make it on TV, it's still a thing on TV to us. Before we leave, we've at least got to do a Russell Westbrook update because his season is done. Greg, floor is yours. Russell Westbrook, he can sure score triple doubles, but he sure as hell can't think straight when he's trying to make a pass. It's the Russell Westbrook update. Well, guys, the Clippers season unfortunately came to an end last week as the Dallas Mavericks beat the Clippers in Game 6 of the Western Conference quarterfinals. So let's get Russ's playoff stats. In Game 1, where the Clippers won 109-97, Russ scored 13 points. In Game 2, where the Clippers lost 96-93, he scored 7 points. In game three, where the Clippers lost 101 to 90, you know how many points he scored? Well, it could be a fun number like 69, so. Nice. Well, it wasn't 69, you goof. So, how many points did he score? Uno. One point. He almost matched his jersey number. Okay. In game four, where the Clippers won 116 to 111, he scored five points. In Game 5, 
where the Clippers lost by 30, he scored six points. And in game six, where they lost by 10, he scored six points. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't mention in game three, he got ejected because he started getting into a bit of a fight with Dallas Mavericks player P.J. Washington. And not even joking, and Greg and Chico can vouch for this, when I saw this happen during the game, the first thing I did was jump on to our little chat and said, guys, turn this on. Russell Westbrook is getting booted from the game. Russell Westbrook was legitimately PO'd. So I guess we can close the book on the Russell Westbrook update for the 23-24 season just quickly with some final stats. For the regular season, he averaged 11.1 points, five rebounds, 4.5 assists, and shot 45.4% from the field, all of which, minus the points per game, put him in the top 100 in the NBA. Not bad for a person who is in his 16th season in the NBA at age 35. Uh, And also just the points per game, that 11.1 put him at 118th. But still, not bad production from a point guard over the age of 35. So we closed one book, and we're going to open another because we love you. It's time for a Joey Gallo update. What a do Joey Gallo. He can't hit over 200, but he can sure smack a ball over the fence. It's the Joey Gallo update. It's been two weeks since we talked about Joey Gallo, and sad to say, there's not much of an update because he is on the injured list. The last time he played, oddly enough, was the last recording date that we did, a Joey Gallo update, which would have been the 26th of April. He went 0 for 4, landed on the 10-day DL, and he's been there ever since. Still on there as of the time we're recording this. Went over four that night, so his average went down to an amazing 122. That's laughable. I'm sorry. I know some of us love our Joey Gallo around here, but that's pitiful. So that's your Joey Gallo update. There really is no update. He's injured. Boy, that was quick. Now let's officially wrap everything up. No, no, we're not going to throw in a match game of Hollywood Squares hour update we'll save that for thursday but for now what i can tell you is if you go over to our website at it was a thing on tv.com you can listen to the 470 episodes that came before this one and don't forget on top of those episodes we've got a whole bunch of stuff there mini shows live shows standard versions for the show we got lots of stuff there And please don't forget, we're on all social media, specifically Instagram, Threads, and Mastodon, at It Was A Thing On TV, except for Facebook. You got to go to It Was A Thing On TV podcast. And please, if you want to follow us on Mastodon, you need to do a search for us at It Was A Thing On TV at tvwatch.party. And also remember, you can find us on any worthwhile podcast service, including Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Audible, TuneIn Radio, any really good podcast player, even the independent ones, you'll be able to find us with ease. And if worse meets worst, get the Podbean player because we are hosted through Podbean. We're there, easy to find. But please also don't forget we are on YouTube where you can like and subscribe to our channel. And please don't forget to hit that notification bell to keep informed of all future uploads on the channel, including what's coming up on the podcast next time. Oh boy, guys, we got a story to share regarding the next episode because we had plans and we promoted this not unlike the second pilot last week where I said, Hey, you know what guys I'm calling an audible. We've got to cover the virtual Ed Sullivan show. We're not necessarily calling an audible in this case, but there's some circumstances that are making us sort of change direction And oddly enough, what's going to be in that show's place is the show that the virtual Ed Sullivan show replaced. So, yay, we're covering that show 
but a week later. And I'm sure you'll enjoy that show. Maybe we'll be your fast friends after you hear that episode. Tee hee hee. Right here at It Was a Thing on TV. Please stay safe. Thank you for listening. And come back on Thursday for yet another entry in 2024's Pilot Month. Wow! Janice, you have a $5 lead over Lynn, a $15 lead over Joel, and this could be yours. Sally? Janice, as a mother of six, you'll probably need some relaxing time, and this is terrific for you. It's the Mitsubishi X7 Interplay Stereo System featuring vertical turntable, AM, FM, stereo receiver, cassette deck with noise reduction, plus two-way stereo speaker. It fits on a shelf because it's only eight inches deep. It's furnished by Mitsubishi, normally priced at $550. It can be yours, Janice, for only $8 on sale with century.